Hello, Western Civ II again. So we're going to be beginning in the 1960s by looking at a crisis that brought the world closer to the brink of nuclear annihilation than it ever was before or since. This is the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. President Kennedy had been president for a little over a year and a half while the uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the leader of the Soviet Union, was this man. This is Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev was the head of the Soviet Union in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, he was a, uh, well, I guess I could say he was kind of an uncouth man. Uh, he was uh, very much a man of the people, a man of the farm, by upbringing in the Soviet Union. He had grown up working on a collective farm and he never lost, uh, never lost some of that rustic quality. Um, he was fond of very earthy humor and uh, he often behaved in ways that shocked the rest of the world. For example, he once was attending the United Nations in New York City, uh, sitting at the Soviet Union delegation's table in the Security Council, and a speaker for the United States started saying something that Khrushchev disapproved of. So he pulled off his shoe and began banging it on the desk in the UN. That's pretty typical of Nikita Khrushchev. He was a, a fairly hot-headed fellow, uh, prone to shouting, um, a very interesting man. But Nikita Khrushchev made a decision in 1962, which had enormous consequences, Khrushchev decided that with American troops being stationed in Western Europe and even in Turkey, Turkey doesn't actually border the Soviet Union, but it comes very close and it's just across the Black Sea from Ukraine, which was part of the Soviet Union. So Nikita Khrushchev decided with American troops so close to, to Russia, or the Soviet Union in Europe and in Turkey, and especially the fact that there were nuclear missiles, Jupiter nuclear missiles of the United States Air Force, were stationed in Turkey. Turkey was a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, our alliance to counter the Soviets. We had nuclear missiles in Turkey, not far from the Soviet Union. And he decided that he needed missiles close to the United States. Now, in 1959, <coughs> pardon me, in 1959, uh, the rebels led by Fidel Castro, rebels who were opposing the dictatorship of Juan Batista in Cuba, on the island of Cuba, just off the coast of Florida, rebels led by Fidel Castro managed to seize power and take over the government of Cuba. Well, it turns out that shortly after taking power in Havana, Cuba, Fidel Castro announced that he was a communist and he wanted an alliance with the Soviet Union. And so the Soviets began giving him every support they could in Cuba. Meanwhile, the United States cut off ties with Cuba, put an embargo on Cuba, meaning Americans couldn't trade with Cuba. To this day, it's still illegal to get Cuban cigars and bring them in the United States. All the things have slightly eased up. Uh, the Obama administration decided to ease the embargo. Uh, the Trump administration put some parts of it back into place when he took office. But for a very long time, we've had very uh, poor relations with Cuba. And that all began with Castro taking power and announcing he was a communist. The Communist Party still runs Cuba to this day. But Nikita Khrushchev got the idea in 1962 that he would counter American missiles in Cuba and in, in, in Europe and Turkey by putting missiles of the Soviet Union's own in Cuba. Well, they didn't tell the world they were going to do this, but the United States operated spy planes, high altitude U-2 spy planes. U-2, yeah, the Irish band with Bono as its lead singer calls up U-2 is named after these high-altitude spy planes. And these high-altitude spy planes would fly over Cuba taking photographs. 
1962, in October of 1962, they took pictures like this one. Now, to you and me, that may not look like much. But to analysts in the Pentagon, when they started looking at these pictures, they saw missile components, transporters for missiles, sheds where they could put the missiles together, uh, all kind of the tracking device for, for launching missiles and telling where they're going from, a launch pad. They could tell that launch pads and missiles were being assembled in Cuba. And that news was brought to President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, our president. Well, Kennedy knew that this was a major problem. And I showed this in the last video. But here we see the range of these missiles. We knew that the missiles they were building had a range of approximately 1,250 miles. They could accurately hit a target <clears throat> that far away. And you can see this, this range here uh, meant that these missiles were in range of Washington, D.C., St. Louis, Dallas, Houston, Miami, New Orleans. Uh, and the real rub here was how short a reaction time the United States would have uh, if we uh, were attacked by these missiles. About half an hour, Washington, D.C. could be an irradiated pile of rubble. Uh, because of these things. That was so short a time, it's doubtful the president could even be gotten to safety and, and a counter-strike ordered before the missiles hit. Uh, so this these missiles were considered a threat of what is known as a first strike weapon, that these missiles could be used by the Soviet Union to try to knock us out before we could attack them in response. Um to start a war and end it with one blow. That was the fear of what these missiles were for. Well, when the news came to the president, he assembled his top military advisors, his top diplomatic advisors in the White House. Now, I want to let you know that the nine days this crisis went on, uh, many people study them to this day. This, this is widely considered to be a model of how presidential decision-making should be done. Obviously, the final decisions come down to the president, but he got advice every step of the way from a dozen people of all kinds of different backgrounds, and he considered carefully every step he took along the way uh, and weighed it all very carefully. This is considered to be almost a model of how presidents should act in a crisis. Um, it was, of course, terrible time. I'm sure they got very little sleep in, the, in more than a week's time. Uh, but the way the crisis ended, the way it was resolved, brought peace and stability back to the earth after taking us to the very brink of World War III. Well, when the news arrived in D.C., when the pictures arrived and the Pentagon found out, the president was told about these missiles, there were generals in the Pentagon who said the only option was to attack and to attack quickly, use the Air Force to strike all these launch pads and missile locations immediately. They feared that once the missiles were operational, uh, there would be nothing we could do. Hit hard with Air Forces and then invade on the ground and seize the island of Cuba. Well, there, this was a very risky venture. Amphibious assaults usually take months or years to plan. And now they're talking about carrying off major amphibious assaults in a matter of days. And uh, the airstrikes were a problem. For one thing, nobody knew for sure if these missiles could launch or not. If they're ready to launch, would the Russians launch them now? Uh, if we attacked, would they try to launch them before we could destroy them? And by the way, we now know some of them were operational. Some of them could have been launched on the day that, that, that the Pentagon and some generals wanted to attack. Uh, but Kennedy says, no, we're not going to attack. Um, and besides that, remember, there were Soviet military personnel on the island of Cuba. If we attack those Soviet missiles, Soviet soldiers are going to die. 
And this could be seen by Moscow as beginning a war against the Soviet Union. So, you know, they're just sitting there on the ground. If we attack them, we're the ones starting war with the Soviet Union. And Kennedy did not want that. He didn't want dead Russians. He did not want a war with the Soviet Union starting. He knew it was very uncertain that we could seize the island, that we could destroy all the missiles before they could launch. All those things, he just said, we cannot do this. He con confronts the Soviets. They had a, a teletype. It was called a hotline, but it wasn't actually a telephone. There was a, a, a teletype hotline between Moscow and Washington so they could communicate uh, quickly. Uh, and he sent and demanded of Khrushchev to remove the missiles. Khrushchev said no. They are not coming out. And that more missiles were on the way was very clear. Intelligence showed Soviet ships just the right size and type to carry more missile technology to Cuba. And it's at this point, instead of attacking the missiles, instead of invading Cuba, that Kennedy made a crucial decision. This map calls it a U.S. naval blockade, but they actually called it a quarantine a very topical term uh, for us today, but they called it a quarantine of Cuba not to allow any Soviet material to enter Cuba. And the U.S. Navy was sent out, and you see the line beyond which we announced we would allow no Soviet ships to come to Cuba unless they were stopped and inspected by the U.S. Navy and certified as not having any equipment to service nuclear weapons. And so the United States announced this policy. The Soviet Union pitched a fit about this policy. You are not stopping our ships. You are not boarding and inspecting them. And then we waited. The world waited on pins and needles to see what would happen. Two separate flotillas of Soviet ships approached the quarantine line. And U.S. naval forces <coughs> came out to meet them. And the two sides sat there and looked at each other for the better part of a day. The Soviets did not cross the quarantine line. The United States said if they wanted to cross, they would have to let us board and inspect. And the Soviets responded with a cold shoulder. What we did not know then, but we do know now, is there were actually Soviet nuclear submarines right on those sites. And at least one of those submarines had a, a second-in-command who wanted to attack the U.S. naval ships right then and there with nuclear-tipped torpedoes. But the captain made the decision not to act. So the war could have begun right there in, on the high seas with the Soviets and Americans facing each other on the waves. But thankfully, that Soviet captain did not attack. Well, the, the ship sat there for the better part of a day when, quietly, with no announcement at all, the Soviet fleet turned around and retreated back to the open ocean. So the Soviets blinked. The Soviets backed down. That bought a little time. John Kennedy then sent his brother, his younger brother, Bobby, was his most trusted advisor, to meet with a Soviet ambassador. And they actually met in a bar in a hotel near the White House. And there, Bobby Kennedy told the Soviets that his brother was interested in negotiation and that one of the things that was on the table was removing the Jupiter missiles from Turkey, our missiles from Turkey, if the Soviets would remove their missiles from Cuba and offering a pledge from the United States that we would not attack Cuba and that the Soviets would pledge never again to put offensive nuclear weapons in Cuba. And in the end, after several days, that was agreed to. Actually, it was really tense. The teletype clattered away from Moscow to D.C. with a, a message from Khrushchev uh, accepting those terms. And then a few hours later, a much more negative rejection came through the teletype it looks like some generals got a hold of Khrushchev and tried to bully him into not reaching this deal with Kennedy. And a second message had been sent. But Kennedy made the decision to act like the second message had never arrived, that, that Khrushchev could get his own generals in line. 
and that there didn't have to be war. So literally, John Kennedy just pretended that the second negative message had never come. He just ignored it and, and told the world about the first positive message. <laughs> and that meant that Khrushchev had to go with the first positive message or he would have looked like a fool. So uh, in the end, the Cuban Missile Crisis was diffused with that negotiation. The Soviet missiles were taken out of Cuba. Our missiles were taken out of Turkey, and the world returned to tense peace. So World War III did not happen in 1962, thanks be to God. We'll continue with our next lecture. Bye.